Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, so glad to see you today. Welcome those of you that are here in Auditorium One. Maybe if you're joining in Auditorium Two, so glad that you're here. Maybe you're joining us online or by way of television or the podcast. It is a privilege to have you with us today. Grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter five, whether you have it in a print or a digital form. Turn to Matthew chapter five. Hey, in, in uh, about 10 days or so, on Wednesday, November 2nd, we will have our next First Wednesday service, so not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, and uh, if you've not been out for one of our first Wednesday services, it's an opportunity for us to come together and to spend some time in worship. We have a time in God's word and a really special time of seeking the Lord together. We've got great things lined up both for your middle school and high school students, as well as elementary and early childhood uh, age children. It's gonna be a really special night, and so if you've not been out before, I hope that you will come out November 2nd for our next First Wednesday service. That's also a really special day, and I'm gonna ask you to help me with this. There is a really special birthday that's gonna happen on November 2nd, and uh, we don't usually celebrate birthdays, but on that day, someone who's been a long-term member of Calvary, Thelma Van Diver, is gonna turn 100 years old on November 2nd. And uh, Thelma will be watching this service near that time, and it won't quite be your birthday, Thelma, but we wanna thank you for who you are, for your investment in so many people in this church over the years. You are loved, you are a role model, and all together, we're gonna say happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday. And when you turn 100, we'll do the same for you. And uh, that will be awesome. Happy birthday. Hey, we are in a series of messages that we're calling Flip the Script. We're looking at things from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said where he changed things from how the earthly kingdom looks at life to how we look at things in Jesus' kingdom, the way that we look at life that will last forever. And a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that um, the Sermon on the Mount was preached on a mountain along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And honestly, I've had the privilege to be there a few times. It's one of my favorite places in the world. I wanna show you a couple of pictures. This first one is a picture of the Sea of Galilee at sunrise. And you can just kinda see, it's a beautiful place. You've got the mountain ranges that circle the whole Sea of Galilee. And then this spot, I actually have this next picture hanging in my office. It's from a spot that overlooks that whole region. There are rings of mountains that go all around the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of down in a bowl. This is a spot very close to the place that they believe where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Now this was uh, taken early in the year in January. So in other parts of the year would be more lush and green, but a beautiful spot. So if you're kind of picturing maybe what it was like, we believe it was something like this, the place where Jesus spoke and he taught that. And we've been working our way through this sermon. And so far we've looked at the Beatitudes, the opening statements that Jesus gave to us that all begin with the word blessed. And we've been through uh, uh, most of them. We've got two more that we're gonna hit today. We took a break from that last week and just kind of publicly wanna thank Pastor John Wooten, our, our uh, friend and uh, leader of the Ohio Ministry Network for being with us last week. If you weren't here or didn't get a chance to watch the message, I wanna encourage you to go back and catch that, especially if you feel like you're in some kind of unique season of change in your life. He talked about deconstructing detours and a really powerful message. And so thanks, Pastor John for that good word last week. Let's jump right into the text. Matthew chapter five, verse 10. We're gonna look at the last two Beatitudes today that Jesus gives to us. Matthew chapter five, verse 10. Blessed are those who are... It's gonna be a fun day, isn't it? <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Today we're gonna talk about principles for the persecuted. I don't know if you've ever felt persecuted, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like this, but the Bible talks to us about it. Jesus actually gives us the last two Beatitudes have this same theme. So today we're gonna to talk about principles for the persecuted as we look at that passage. Here's the first one, number one, and, and this one isn't just for the persecuted. I, I think it fits in all different areas of our lives. You are blessed even on the bad days. You are blessed on even the bad days. See, this, this passage of scripture caught me off guard. 
Because you're reading through it, and you know, we have this certain idea of blessing in our lives, and I'm reading it, Matthew chapter five, verse 10, and it says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And I thought, that does not make sense. Like, I wouldn't put those two things together. I don't think any of us wake up in the morning and go, boy, I sure hope I'm persecuted. I sure hope it's a bad day. I sure hope things don't go right. And Jesus says, when they don't go right, when you have a bad day, you're still blessed. You're blessed on even the bad days. This isn't just about persecution. This is a theme that runs throughout scripture. And I stop and pause here for a moment because it's a mindset that we sometimes have to, we, we have to shift our attitudes sometimes and think about this, that we can find joy in even the disappointing, difficult, and unexpected moments in life. Uh, James says it this way, James chapter one, verse two. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Usually I wake up in the morning and go, I will consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when everything goes my way. Can I get an amen? amen. Right, that's how we think. That's not what James says. And he, he unpacks this even more. I'll let you read the book of James for yourself, but he says, look, when you face trials, all kinds, not just persecution, and when you have a bad day, Consider it pure joy. Because even in those difficult times, God is working something out. And sometimes we need to kind of shift our minds or shift our thoughts so that we can see life in that way. Because there's more to life than just the bad day. I, I was really thankful that Pastor John Wooten could, um, could preach last week because we were out of town. Some of you were probably wondering, hey, where were you, Chad? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, go, uh, hey, thanks for asking. Yeah, so last week... Uh, our family was all together. Our son, Evan, ran the Columbus Marathon. And uh, so it's funny, when, when, you're, when your kids are little, you just have to go out to the, the ball field sometimes to support them. When they get older, you have to go to great lengths to support them. Isn't that true? <laughs> Don't stop supporting them as a kid. Don't stop supporting them. And uh, so we got to go to the Columbus Marathon. Here's a, here's a picture of uh, Rhonda and I with Evan after he crossed the finish line. And uh, yeah, it was fun. Evan has, I've, I've never been a runner. Evan has done marathons. Our son Clayton has done marathons. It's not genetic. I don't know where it, I don't know where it comes from. And this, we had our fun little shirts run, Evan run. And then, and then this is Evan's biggest fan right here. That's Lewis. Did I, did I tell you I'm a grandpa? I mentioned that. Look at that shirt. My uncle runs this town. Get it? Get, get, get what it means? Yeah. So... Look at that face. <laughs> Two thoughts. One, some of you look like that on Sundays. So fix it. And then two, like it, that was about mile 18 and he was missing Evan something fierce at that moment. We, we had a blast and uh, it, was just, it was just fun. So you get to the end and the Columbus Marathon in particular is really just, just kind of a, a, it was a beautiful day. It was a really cool race. And when you get towards the finish line, you kind of, you, you round the, the, the street as it comes around, you kind of come under this, this overpass. And as you do, then it kind of curves and kind of comes up to a hill where the, the finish line is and the people are all lined up there. And it was, it was fun to just kind of watch and see this because there's nothing, I don't know if any of you have run it. There's nothing easy about it. I just, I think it's got to require some kind of minor brain damage at least, doesn't it? <laughs> At least, there's nothing easy about it. And you'd watch these people and they'd, they'd round the corner and then people would start to cheer for them and they start to see people that they see along the way. And then all of a sudden the walkers start to run again and the runners start to sprint again because the whole thing has been about that finish line. So when you get to mile nine and your mind starts playing tricks on you or you get to mile 18 and you're wondering if I can pick my feet up anymore, or you get to mile 24 and there's certain things that just don't work right. You keep going, not because you necessarily enjoy the pain, I'm told. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm told this. <laughs> but because there's a finish line. And that's what you're moving towards. That's what, that's what you're running for. The Columbus Marathon in particular is really cool because all the, the funds that they raise go to Nationwide Children's Hospital, saving lives right? Some of the youngest, most vulnerable lives. And what's cool is along the way at each mile, they have a little spot where there's a family that's there with a child who has been experiencing healthcare from Nationwide Children's Hospital. So as you run the race, you're literally seeing lives that have been saved by the cause that you're running for. 
So these runners will go by and they'll high five these kids and they'll high five these families. And it's this like, this really meaningful thing that happens. So when you're about ready to give up at mile 17, you see that child and it gives you a little boost to keep running. Isn't that cool? The way that they do that. Because even through all the pain and all the difficulty, you know that what you're running for is not the, the pain of the experience, but the finish line and the lives that are changed because of it. So Jesus says, Blessed are the persecuted, not because you're persecuted, but because there's something more on the other end. It's not just what you're going through at mile six or mile 18 or mile 25. It's the fact that there's a finish line and that's what you're running for. That's not true just about persecution. It's true about all the bad days, isn't it? So James says, count it all joy when you experience trials, not because the trial's fun, but because on the other side of that trial is a reward that you're running for and you're changing lives all along the way. Now look, some of you need to hear that because you're at a certain point in your race where you thought about giving up or where right now it's particularly filled with pain or you're not sure if you're gonna be able to finish. And know this, that even on your bad days, you're blessed. Even when life is hard, your blessing doesn't depend on external circumstances. It depends on what God is doing on the inside. And some of you just need to hear, keep running. Because even when life is difficult, there's still blessing. Isn't that true? Now that that takes us into the second thing I want you to see. Let's jump back. Number two, here's the second thought about persecution. Persecution is to be expected. Number two, persecution is to be expected. I told you today would be fun, didn't I? What's persecution? Well, when someone is oppressed because of their faith, then we shouldn't be surprised by it. Go to the Old Testament and the prophets are persecuted. When you go to the New Testament, part of the story of the Gospels is that the followers of Jesus experience persecution. Even Jesus himself has to suffer and die, and he, what we experience, the grace that we know because of what he did on the cross, we'll, we'll share in communion here in just a little while, and maybe if you're watching online or by television, you might wanna find something that would represent the communion elements so that you can join us, and if you're here in the building and didn't have a chance to um, pick up the elements on your way in, they're right outside of the different entrances. But even Jesus' death, he, he suffered because of persecution, The Bible makes it very clear that we live in a world that there has what Paul refers to as the spirit of antichrist. So it is a world and even our culture that is in opposition to the things of God. There there is the revelation of Christ that is despised. So not only might we be persecuted, it's actually, scripture says, a sign oftentimes that you are on the right side of things with God when you experience persecution. Now I don't think you should wake up in the morning and go wonder who I can get to persecute me today. That's kind of a bad attitude. But when it comes your way, don't be surprised. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that persecution will always be linked with those that follow Jesus because there will always be a tension between the flesh and the spirit, true? So persecution is to be expected. It was part of the deal from day one. Jesus said this, John chapter 15, verse 20. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, They will persecute you also, period. He tells us that this is coming. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, back during uh, kind of the World War II era, said discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. And it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it is a joy and a token of his grace. We might have to shift our thinking on this a little bit. Because sometimes we tend to think that persecution is bad or maybe that something has gone wrong if we're persecuted. Do you you remember Jesus has been walking us through these beatitudes? The one we ended with a couple of weeks ago was blessed are the peacemakers. Anybody remember this? What's the very next one he goes to? Blessed are the persecuted. He's saying you might make peace one day and be persecuted for it the next. You can do the right thing and then still experience an unpleasant outcome because of it. We have a tendency to think if I do the right thing, then everything's gonna be good. If I follow Jesus, then I'll have more money, I'll be more healthy, and I'll be better looking. Can I get an amen? Right? But maybe not. He says sometimes, even when you're doing the right things, 
you might face persecution. I don't know, historically, that's not how we've known our faith in, in the West, especially in the United States. We often view a disciple of Jesus with someone who is physically, maybe even financially, maybe even in tangible ways blessed, but for many other people in other parts of the world, when they choose to follow Jesus, it's not part of the deal that things get better, it's part of the deal that things get more difficult. And I think we need to keep that in mind that for most of history, that's actually been a part of what's in alignment with being a follower of Jesus. The persecution comes with it. Like, like Jesus talks about this a little bit more. He unpacks it. And if we go back to verse 11 of Matthew chapter five, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Well, I don't like any of that. Anybody else? Like, I, I don't like for people to say things about me that aren't true. I, I don't want to be insulted. I, I want to be liked. My spiritual gift is likability. Anybody else? But I want that. And yet, Jesus says, you know what comes with the territory? People might insult you. They, they might persecute you. They might even tell lies about you. And still, you're blessed. Blessed. I came across an article that listed different degrees of persecution, like things that you might experience in different areas, parts of the world, different things. Oftentimes, persecution might just start with disapproval. There's ridicule, kind of a pressure to conform, maybe a loss of educational opportunities, economic sanctions, maybe shunning, alienation from community, maybe a loss of employment or a loss of property. And then it gets even more messy from there. It could be physical abuse, mob violence, harassment by officials, kidnapping, forced labor, imprisonment, physical torture, or possibly even execution. Persecution is something that we need to keep in mind because it's actually something that is very much still happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, not just in the past, not just in the first centuries. It's still happening today. There's an organization called Open Doors, and every year they publish what they call the World Watch List, where they, they publish the 50 most dangerous countries in the world in which to be a Christian. These countries represent 309 million Christians living in places with very high or extreme levels of persecution. That's actually up by over 40 million people from the year before. If you wanna know who the top 10 worst persecutors are, North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, and India round out the top 10. Let's make it a little more practical. Every single day, there's 13 Christians worldwide who are killed because of their faith. You say 13, it's not that many. We'll multiply that by 365 and think how many that is on an annual basis. And it's probably more than you've thought of recently. 12 people every day are unjustly arrested or imprisoned and another five are abducted. They publish this list to help people to know how to pray for a world that sometimes we don't even think about. And the reality is not only is persecution to be expected, but for millions of Christians around the world, it is today very much a part of the reality of their lives. I don't know, every so often I'll hear somebody just kind of throw that word around. Well, I'm just being so persecuted. And I want to go, are you now? Anybody? Anybody got a friend that you, you know them well enough that you know their life? Like, you're not judgy. You just, you just know what their life is like. And every so often they're like, my life is so hard. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, tell me, what's going on? Oh, I got this going on. I got that going on. My life's so hard. Do you know those people? And you're standing there and thinking to yourself, I got it worse than you, loser. Anybody, you've got that? <laughs> and this prophetic spirit that's not from God stirs up in you and you just want to say to them, quit your crying, anybody? <laughs> Be mindful of the way you use the word persecuted. Because there are thousands of people around the world who just saying they're a follower of Jesus Christ could cost them so much. And so many times we're so focused on how hard our lives are that we need the Holy Spirit to say to us, hey, quit your crying and start your praying. Quit your crying and start standing with those. 
who are truly suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. We had a missionary from West Africa come and speak to our team recently. They literally can't be in the country where they serve anymore because there's so much conflict and tension. And he said he just recently got a message from someone that they've been sharing the gospel with. And the message came and said, I'm pretty sure I want to be baptized. Now we're gonna have baptisms next Sunday and if you've not yet been baptized since you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, we'd love to have you join us. It is gonna be a celebration. I hope you'll jump online and sign up. But let's not take for granted the freedoms that we have. Because he said, you have no idea what a big deal it is that this person sent this message. Because if they're baptized, it will mean that there will be a separation between them and their family. And they could lose their livelihood. There's a potential that they could lose their life because they've aligned themselves with Jesus Christ. There is a world that is being persecuted. And I think you and I do well to keep it in mind, don't you? Back to the text, Matthew chapter five, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There's a third thing that I want you to see here, and I want you to see how Jesus is lining this up, because we've been reading these verses, these Beatitudes, all about how to live a life that is blessed, and what Jesus really highlights for us here is this, that the righteous life is the blessed life. Like, if you want to live a life that is blessed, here's the third thing I want you to see. Number three, that the righteous life is the blessed life. If you want to live a life that is blessed, it starts with righteousness. And we use the word righteousness a lot. It's in scripture a lot. And you say, well, Chad, what do I do? If I want to be righteous, how do I live a life of righteousness? And the scripture's full of it, but, but what you see right there as far as teaching on what righteousness is, what it comes down to is that right here in this passage, Jesus has already given us a to-do list, right? Because when he says righteousness here in these verses, he's referring back to all the other beatitudes he's already given us. Because he's already told us how to live a life that's right. He's already told us how to flip the script and live a life that is honored in his kingdom. We call them the Beatitudes. He says, if you want to live a life that is righteous, then you'll be blessed when you're poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He talks about the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, even the persecuted, when you do those things, when you live in that way, when you choose to be blessed and follow Jesus with that list, that's when you choose righteousness. When you decide to look more like Jesus, that's when you know that you're being righteous. Imitating Jesus is righteousness. If you wanna know how to be righteous, if you wanna know what righteousness is, I'll give you a real simple definition. Look more like Jesus, right? Imitating Jesus is righteousness. And so that's what he spells out here, and that's how we'll be blessed. We, we were moving some stuff around recently, and in the process, we, we came across some old pictures. And so I was going through them from, you know, 10, 20, none of your business years ago, and I'm, I'm going through them. And I look at a couple of them, and you're like, I can't believe I ever wore that. Anybody? <laughs> like, you look at some things, and you're like, who, how did, wh who said that was a good idea? I can't believe I wore that. There was a couple where I looked at Ron and I said, I can't believe you dated that. Like, it's just crazy. But style happens that way. There are, I've seen pictures of you. There are things you wore years ago that you should not have and you should destroy the evidence because you looked crazy, but you didn't at the time. Do you know why? Because everybody else was popping their collars. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like everybody else was wearing those colors nobody should wear. Everybody else looked that goofy. You dressed like that then because everybody else was dressed like that. That was the style of the moment. So we imitated the style of the moment. We looked like that. And later you look back and you, you literally have to repent because you wore that. It was a crime against humanity. But styles change. We're motivated by those things. And that's true with our culture. It's true with our world that's constantly changing around us and says, now you need to look like this and now you need to look like that and now you should look like this and now you should look like that. It's really interesting and I've watched this as a pastor. A lot of times people used to come to the church because they wanted to get principles from the church for how to live their lives because that's where they found their values. Now a lot of people wanna take their values and try to impose them on the things that the church believes. 
And the reality is it's not how it works because the styles of the world around us might change, but who do we want to keep looking like? Give it to me one more time so I'm actually convinced. Who, who do we want to keep looking like? <laughs> yeah, that's who we want to look like. So we want to imitate him. That's righteousness. And this is why this is so important. Because Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted because you look more like me. Blessed are you because of righteousness. Because sometimes we are persecuted. Sometimes we are opposed. Sometimes there's unfair things that happen to us. And look, some of you have said, well, I've been persecuted, but you've been persecuted because of your political ideals. And, and that's probably real. You probably, you probably have been. And some of you have been persecuted because of your background or maybe because of your race. And that's, that's true. You, you probably have been. And some of us have been persecuted because we've done things that are, well, dumb. Isn't that true? <laughs> some of you just do something dumb and you're persecuted. But can I tell you? All those things, whether it's political or whether it's cultural or whether it's just your own lack of judgment, when you're persecuted for those things, that's not because of righteousness. And we need to remember that sometimes the persecution that is blessed is because we've made sure we look more like Jesus. Now look, look, we live in a world and a culture, and I would say this specifically about the society that we live in right now, that is pulling more and more away from biblical ideals, true? So as a result, we need to keep that in mind. You need to defend democracy. I think we need to stand for our principles and our values. I wish personally that more Christians, I wish more people from Calvary would choose to run for office and get involved in the public square. I think we need to have a voice. I think we need to make sure that freedom is stood for and that our values are embraced, that our values are voted, and that our values are expressed. But if in the defense of democracy, you stop looking like Jesus, that's not righteousness. And that's not persecution that's blessed. He calls us to be blessed because we look more like him. Interesting side note, he writes this to a group of people, one of whom was called a zealot, who was actively opposing corrupt politicians and dictatorial leadership. And Jesus says, you're blessed when you're persecuted because of righteousness. What's the alternative? Well, it's, it's apostasy or it's compromise, right? Where you just kind of walk away from those things. And look, the idea of the question is, if you are persecuted for righteousness, if you're persecuted because you look more like Jesus, will you still follow Jesus? Because our idea of blessing, right, is that I will have more, I'll be better looking, and I'll be healthier, I'll be blessed. Jesus says, maybe not. Maybe blessing means that it comes with persecution, not benefits in this life, but benefits in the life to come. So my question is, when the persecution comes, will you still be a follower of Jesus? Let me use what might be kind of a, maybe a little bit of a lame example, and I don't want to offend anybody, but let's just, let's just move to the world of sports. There are some of you that have supported teams for decades that have not seen a winning season, and yet you keep supporting them. And before you judge me or say unkind things about me, my team is in the bottom of the division right now. I know that. I know it. But you keep supporting them, and you go, well, I've been a fan my whole life. I've stood with that team my whole life. And so I'm gonna keep standing with them because there's, there's always next year. And keep standing for those teams because that's where your allegiance lies and it runs real deep. Some of you, this is, even, this is even more interesting than me. If you live in this part of the country, you really only have two choices in college football season. You either cheer for the Wolverines or you cheer for the Buckeyes. Isn't that true? <laughs> like, and then every so often, somebody shows up in a different jersey and I'm like, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? Why are you, why are you, wear, why are you wearing that Nebraska jersey? Like, why, why, why are you doing that? Like, these are the teams around here. And you're like, yeah, but this is my team. Well, take that off because your team's no good, right? Isn't that kind of what you, kind of what you want to say? Or whatever. You know, you, you look at that. You, why, why, are you, why are you wearing that? Because that's my team. That's where I'm from. That's who I am. Because even though everybody else around you doesn't support that team, that's still your team. I'm, I've, I've confessed this publicly before. I have for many, many years been a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And oftentimes, 
Thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> Whatever else I heard was, not, was a spirit, but not a holy one. And so, <laughs> and sometimes you'll watch these away games, right? You'll watch them where you got this stadium that's filled with pagans and in the midst of it, there's one guy in his Steelers jersey just waving his towel. He's standing there for righteousness in a sea of evil, right? In that moment. And I say to myself, what's wrong with that guy? Because he is gonna get beat up in the parking lot. But he does not care because he's gonna stand with his team. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because all of us at some point, and I believe this is only gonna happen more and more in our world right now, are gonna find ourselves in an arena filled with people who embrace the values of a different team than the one that we find ourselves on in God's word. And what are you gonna do in that moment? How are you gonna stand in that moment? Will you stay faithful to team Jesus? Will you live according to the principles in God's word? When persecution comes, will you still believe you're blessed and stay committed to him? If you were to ask one of these weirdos who wear the wrong jersey to an away game, why are you so loyal to your team? They'll probably say, well, because my dad was a fan and his dad before him was a fan. That's what our family is. That's who we are. Parents and grandparents, if you just watch what seems to be happening in the world around us, it's not gonna get any easier for our children to follow Jesus, is it? So you better be passing that faith on now. You better be modeling for them and showing them what it's like to stand for Jesus even when it's not easy. As we get into 2023, first of the year, one of the things we're gonna be bringing back are our Wednesday night kind of family night services. And we're at a place now with volunteers and involvement to do that. And one of the key reasons is because we wanna have opportunities for our students and for our children to not only be in places where they can learn even in more depth the value of memorizing scripture and the value of the principles of God's word and seeing it role modeled by other adults as they live that out, but that they can make relationships with peers that when the rest of the arena is cheering for something else, they'll stand together for Jesus. Does that make sense? So don't miss it. Let me tell you this real quick too. Can I tell you that sometimes I think that subtle persecution is more dangerous than blatant persecution? Sometimes it's that subtle draw to be more like everybody else that can sometimes more, do more damage to our faith than when we have to take a bold stand. So when those moments come, let me show you the fourth kind of principle for persecution. Number four, remember this, that today's persecution brings tomorrow's reward. Number four, today's persecution brings tomorrow's reward. Jesus is speaking to his disciples there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, up on this mountain, overlook the hillside, Sermon on the Mount, and he says to them, hey, you've chosen to follow me. Now, let me tell you what's part of the package. Blessed are the persecuted, so you'll go through some things that are difficult, but let me make you a promise. Matthew chapter five, verse 10. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is, and stay right here for just a minute, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why is he saying this? Because he's looking out and he knows that if these women and men follow him, there's a good chance it'll distance them from their family and they could lose their relationships, probably lose their jobs and income He's God, right? So there's a good chance he's looking at him and knowing who might even lose their life. And he says, if you follow me, it might not work out so well in the kingdom of earth, but you're gonna be blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Your reward is not today, it's tomorrow. Let's go on to verse 11. He says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He doesn't say cry about it and worry about it. Instead, he says in verse 12, rejoice, he says, and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
He says, look, I know you can't see it right now and I know it's difficult right now, but I want you to rejoice because today's persecution is actually building for you tomorrow's reward. I know mile nine is tough and you wanna give up at mile 22, but there is a finish line and that's where you get the prize. And this is a mindset shift for us, right? Look, look at this, Acts chapter five, verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. What happened at the Sanhedrin? They were persecuted. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. We often try to run from difficulty. We often think that, that things are bad when days are bad. And instead they rejoiced and said, we're followers of Jesus. And one of the ways that it's been seen is that we're different from the world around us. Now look, I, I wanna show you something. Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is writing to some people who have experienced persecution. Now look, you and I probably haven't experienced this kind of persecution in our lives, but you've probably, you, you know what it's like to be opposed because of your faith, and I don't think it's gonna get any easier. So we're gonna look at a longer passage of scripture so this is not a good chance to check Facebook or take a nap. Are you with me? Is that all right? I see you at home. Okay, you're with me, right? <laughs> Follow along with this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution at other times, you stood side by side. You stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and last, not, not the kingdom of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. You had better and lasting possessions. So he says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. This message is good for us to hear. Why? Because he says, but we do, if we're in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith and take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. And here's what I want you to hear. He says, but we are not, he says, we are not, we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. He's writing to those who are experiencing persecution and he says, we are not those who shrink back. Instead, we have faith even in the difficult times. And they're encouraging one another. And I just wanna tell you that there is a world out there who is probably not gonna encourage you the persecution you receive is not because somebody wants you to be blessed. And our society is probably not gonna bless you. I don't mean this in a negative way, but do you see what I'm saying from a spiritual standpoint? A culture and a world that is in opposition to the truths of God's word is not going to bless you. God will bless you. And based on what I read there, sometimes he wants to do it through one another. Because if we don't bless one another, who's gonna bless us? Like we need each other. We need to bless one another and stand with one another. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older. Don't say a word. Maybe I'm just getting older. But it seems to me like we're, we're getting more divided over smaller and smaller things. And we're letting more and more things cause us as people, and especially within churches. I'm so thankful, Calvary, that this is a church that has been committed to loving one another and being unified. But can I tell you, that's not what I've seen in other places. And I say to myself, God, how do we preserve that? And one of it is we have to realize if we don't bless each other, who's gonna bless us? Like we need each other. Because we go through seasons of transition and we go through seasons of difficulty and we go through seasons where we don't have answers and disappointment and change and we are family and we need each other. We need to choose to not let each other be scattered and fall away. And we need each other. Can I tell you one of the things I'm so thankful for? I'm so thankful for technology that gives us the opportunity through television, through online ministry, to be able to connect with people. The last craziness of these last few years and some people with health challenges, it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. But can I tell you, there's something powerful when we're together. 
There's something powerful when we're face to face. And there are people that need you to bless them because the world's not gonna do it. And we are not those who shrink back, but we are those who stand faith. We stand with each other in faith. And we need each other in those times. I I grew up kind of out in the country and uh, there were probably, I don't know, four or five, six different houses that had kids where we were all about the same age. And so every day, especially in the summer, we'd all huddle together and we'd just find something to do. Just, we, we'd play baseball over in the Stolbers yard because they, the, they had the longest kind of front yard where we could go out there and we could play. And if you could hit it in the ditch, it was an automatic home run. Can you picture it with me? Those were good days, right? And we would go over and we'd climb the tree at the Aglers. They had this perfect willow tree to climb and we would go over and climb it until Mrs. Agler would open the window and yell out the kitchen, get out of my tree, you boys, right? Kind of thing. I can still hear her voice. Then we'd wait till she, and then we'd do it again. So that was, you know, you'd, you'd do those things. And we'd, you know, we'd play basketball, we'd play football, we'd do all kinds of stuff. And it was inevitable that at some point, with all of us, my cousin lived next door and the Scolton boys were down the street. I mean, we'd get together every day, but it was inevitable at some point every day there would be a fight. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it was me and my cousin. Sometimes it was these guys. So it was a different match. It wasn't always the same thing, but every day there'd be a fight. And at the end, I would always be willing to just go, man, am I glad to go home and get away from those jerks. Anybody? <laughs> we had a good time. It was fun. But at the end, it just, I don't know, things just weren't right. And it ended in a fight. And I was just glad to go home. And so many of us find ourselves every day in the places where we are in some kind of fight. It's like every day we end with some kind of conflict. Every day there's some kind of pressure. Every day there's some kind of tension. Every day we just feel on the outside. And you know what we need? We need a place to go home to. We need to know that we're with people who share the same values, who appreciate us and love us. And so don't you dare take for granted that when you walk through the doors of this building or when you interact with the friends that you have in a life group or when it it just, I, I just heard a story today of when God puts someone in your heart to pray for them and think of them, don't think that you're not supposed to shoot them a quick text or a call because we need each other, do we not? Look, when you walk through the halls of Calvary, when you pass someone in the atrium, you don't know the pressure that that student is under to do things in their relationship that the Bible says that they should not do. And you don't know what's happened to that person at work because either of what they did do or what they would not do because they were trying to live a life of righteousness. And you don't know what it's like for that person when they've decided to be a person of faith in their family and their family says, we don't want your faith around here. And when they walk in the doors of this building, when they interact with their brothers and sisters in Christ at Calvary, it's like they can come home away from the fight. Does that make sense? And in a world like that, that does not bless us, God says you are blessed and he wants to do it when we do not shrink back, but when we stand with one another. So let's be committed to be people who stand together which takes us to the the last principle for the persecuted. Number five, you are blessed when you follow Jesus. Number five, you are blessed when you follow Jesus. Look, that's what we've been looking at this whole time. But I wanna show you something just really interesting here in this passage. And I want you to focus on this fact that you are blessed. Matthew chapter five, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've read that verse over and over again today, but it lines up with all the other beatitudes that Jesus has been giving, right? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. He runs through them all. And did you notice something for my grammar nerds in the crowd? Those have all been in the third person. Jesus has just kind of been speaking them out there. Blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the. Then verse 11, Matthew chapter five, verse 11, Jesus says, blessed are you. Do you see the shift here? He goes from third person to second person. He's not just talking to everybody. He's talking to you now. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I used to be a kid's pastor 
So I, I still love to interact with, with kids at church and, and uh, what's been kind of wild is I'm always in here in the boring service instead of in kids church with, with the kids, right? So I don't have a whole lot of relationships. And even like in the, the, um, the online world, it was interesting because kids will see me on a screen somewhere preaching and they'll know I'm the pastor, but I don't have any relationship with them. So sometimes I'll be walking through the atrium and I'll see these kids that have only seen me on a screen and they just look at me. It's real. You know, and I'll come up and I'll have a conversation with mom and dad and the kids wear name tags if they've checked in down in the, in the kids area, part of our security process, so they're wearing a name tag. And so sometimes I've never met the child before, but I'll look down and I'll go, how are you, Johnny? And they're like, oh, he knows my name. I don't tell them you're wearing a name tag, right? I don't know. It's just kind of fun to watch that because you know what happened. All of a sudden, that guy that's just out there spoke right to them. It wasn't just some word out there. I was talking right to them. For eight Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the. And then I can't help but think that he just stopped. And he looked over and he knew what it was gonna cost some of these people to follow him. And then just throwing out another beatitude, he stopped and he looked over and he said, blessed are you, because I know it's gonna cost you something. And blessed are you, Marty, Jennifer, because I know it's not easy, but you're blessed. And Mary, I know it's not simple, but you're blessed. And Jeffrey, you're loved. And Jesus looked right at them as individuals, not just this big crowd that he's throwing stories out to. He says, Ron, you're a Browns fan and you're blessed. <laughs> that was not of the Lord, but I loved it. <laughs> and he looked right at him. And he said, this isn't just some idea out there that's floating around in space. He says, even on your worst days, you're blessed and you're blessed and you're blessed if you follow me. So can I, we're gonna come to the Lord's table in just a moment, but can I ask you just to bow your heads, close your eyes. In this room, watching this on a screen somewhere, I know it's not everybody, but today somebody needed Jesus to call you by name and he's doing it right now. And he's saying to you, you're blessed. This isn't just a principle for somebody else. This race you're running, you're not alone. There is a reward for you at the finish line. So don't you give up and don't you stop encouraging one another because Jesus is looking you right in your spiritual eyes right now. And he wants you to know that where you are, what you're walking through, you're blessed. Father, thank you for your word. And God, when we face opposition or when we deal with difficulties or when it seems like we're just standing alone, when we're unsure at mile two or when we're weary at mile 25, Lord, would you remind us that when we live for righteousness, that when we live for you, that that's where we're blessed. God, before this day is over, before we walk out of this building, Lord, would you use us to speak words of blessing to one another, to bring encouragement and strength to each other so we look to and trust in you. And Lord, I, I can't help but think that there's somebody who's hearing these words today that more than just being blessed, they know that they need forgiveness and they need your grace, that they can't do it on their own anymore. That right now in this moment, they would say, Jesus, I give you my life. I choose to follow you. I have decided to follow Jesus. In this moment, we pray.
In Jesus' name. I want to invite you to take the communion elements with me, if you would, please. And Paul says that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. He tells us that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. And I'm gonna invite you to take the bread. You can peel that first layer back. And as you hold the bread in your hands, would you stop for just a moment and take a look on the inside? Are there things that you need to ask forgiveness for? Are there things you've hold on to that you need to give to Jesus today? And you need to say, God, I, I ask your forgiveness. I give this to you. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we come to you today. And Jesus, we remember your sacrifice. And we remember that you gave your life for us. And Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. And it's with that in mind that we determine not just to thank you today, God, and remember, but to affirm from this day forward that we are not those who shrink back, but that we will follow Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share in the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, it's because of your blood that there is life and forgiveness and healing and hope. And Lord, even though we might find ourselves at times different, separated, and alone in a world that does not trust in you, Lord, we still choose to say we follow Jesus. We thank you for the work your blood does in our lives, and we remember it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share in the cup together. Would you stand with me, please, as we wrap up and uh, as we go today? Can I bless you? Lord, I ask that you would bless this church in this building, watching online, listening to a podcast, watching on television somewhere, wherever they might be right now. Lord, would you bless them? Lord, and in seasons that are difficult and hard, would you remind them that your reward is at the finish line? Lord, in times when they find themselves alone, would you bless them? And in moments when they're not sure if they can do it, would you bless them? And God, when they wonder if they're all alone, would you remind them that you have today spoken clearly and directly right to them? And God, would you bless them? Lord, I, I pray for our children and for our grandchildren, Lord, for generations to come that our faith would be passed on from generation to generation. Lord, I pray for the one that's gonna go to school tomorrow or gonna go to work tomorrow or is gonna go home and face pressures. Lord, would you bless them as they don't shrink back, but as they stand for you. God, would you bless us with your special favor and with your wonderful peace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Sunday.